Hi, my name's Ian and welcome back to my channel. And the purpose of this series is to provide an overview of select vintage and modern games, their pros and their cons, and what are the essential books and items that you need to play them. With different editions, multiple games appearing to be similar on the surface, and a huge variety of supplements and expansions, newcomers, and even some veterans, can often find it a daunting and confusing place to be. This series hopes to lend a helping hand. If you enjoy dynastic soap operas stretching across hundreds of planets over centuries of conflict, or even if you just like the idea of giant robots blowing the heck out of each other, then today's subject, Battletech, could be the game for you. FASA, or fully, the Freedonian Aeronautics and Space Administration, was founded in 1980 by Jordan Weissman and L. Ross Babcock III. The pair were gamers in the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and through that they had come into contact with naval computer training simulators. They had an idea in creating a simulator-like gaming experience, mixing the realistic, for the time, simulator technology with a form of arcade video game aesthetic. Just to give you an idea of how ambitious this thinking was for the time, the arcades of the day were populated by games such as Breakout and Space Invaders, and the side-scrolling Defender arcade machines were released in the same year as FASIS was founded. If you are going to aim high, well, you may as well shoot for the moon. What they needed to bring their dream about, though, was cash. So they formed FASA to get it initially starting producing material under licence for games such as Traveller, including the High Passage magazine, several supplements and a bunch of adventures, including the Sky Ragers trilogy by the Keith brothers. Eventually they branched out into publishing their own games under licence, starting with Star Trek in 1982, and eventually encompassing Doctor Who and Masters of the Universe franchises. And, from 1984, their own original games with the publication of Battle Droids. Having said that, even Battle Droids could have been said to have been a product and a licence. You see, the game depicted a number of Battle Droids for players to pit against each other, and these were directly lifted from Japanese anime. For example, the Stinger, Warhammer, Phoenix Hawk, Wasp, Crusader, Marauder and Rifleman were all lifted from super-dimensional Fortress Macross, while the Shadowhawk and Griffin were lifted from Fang of the Sun, Dugram. Fassa had sought rights to these artistic designs. The names and game statistics were created by Fassa, from a company that imported model kits from Japan. Battle Droids even included two such kits in the game box. But then came the first of a few legal issues that would float around the game. You see, rightly or wrongly, one George Lucas of Star Wars fame felt that the term droid was his by trademark, despite itself being a shortened ver version of Android. So, a second edition, largely the same as the first, was released in 1985, sporting the new name of Battletech. The game proved to be popular, and became supported by an expansion, City Tech, and a separate but integrated companion game, Aerotech, in 1986 as well as a variety of scenario books that often focused on a particular battle or unit within the Battletech universe, such as Tales of the Black Widow Company and The Fox's Teeth, both released in 1985. A role-playing game, Mech Warrior, was released in 1986. Two factors were key in the success of Battletech. First, it was a game of giant robots beating the snot out of each other, with cartoons such as Transformers arriving to TV screens, the rising popularity of Japanese anime, and the popularity of robot toys such as the Micronauts line that meant that the concept of robots beating the snot out of each other had a growing presence at the time. Second, FASA didn't just create a bored war game and call it a day. Rather, they had learned from their peers, as GDW was doing for the Traveller's Imperium, they set out creating a rich backdrop that had players shouting phrases such as Davian scum, you all pay for the loss of my Shadowhawk. This emerging detail lent itself pretty early on to the idea of novels, since Dragonlance had spearheaded the concept of novels supporting game lines in 1984, it had become an attractive idea. The novels would sell the game, would sell the novels, so to speak. Also, 
When you have talented authors such as the Keith brothers on your side, it's an obvious direction to take. So the first Battletech novel, Decision at Thunder Rift, by William H. Keith, appeared in 1986, supported in-game by the Grey Death Legion sourcebook that provided scenarios for many of the novel's battles. This would be repeated for the Battletech line across a hundred novels, spanning a future history of more than a century. The novels and the source books became a vehicle for driving the game forward, not so much in rules, for the basic rules of Battletech have not changed much in 36 years, but in the telling of stories. For a board game, it has perhaps the richest ongoing story background. A lot of things could be attached to this vehicle, from further source books containing famous units and battles, to faction books, to volumes describing the advance of technology and so on. As the game's metaplot shifted the borders between the antagonistic factions, the raison d'etre for the sourcebooks updating cartography and military dispositions was created. Beyond the board game, Battletech Materials almost wrote itself as authors explored political and military metaplots that easily rival a Game of Thrones and anything Machiavelli put forward. Three further games were added to the Battletech sphere, starting with Succession Wars in 1987, which provided a strategic board game spanning the entire inner sphere, the core area of concern for the game. Battle Force, from 1989, provided a platform for larger-scale battles, with players controlling lances and companies instead of individual units. Finally, Battle Troops, again from 1989, zoomed in to the PBIs of the Battletech universe, giving focus to man-to-man -man combat rather than giant robot to giant robot. And before those familiar with Battletech complain about me referring to Battlemechs as giant robots, just bear in mind that on the surface that is exactly what they are. It's only those of us that have cut deeper into the game that know about mech warriors and neuro helmets and the fear of being cooked alive inside a cockpit that has just been plastered with an inferno round. So bear with me, for the sake of the rookies. Now, remember we started out with a mission goal that FASA were aiming for those simulator computer game centres. Well, we are rapidly approaching the realisation of that dream. But first, FASA had some preparing to do. For one thing, the way they needed to depict battle mechs in the simulators didn't quite match with the way that mechs had been shown in the board game material so far. Limited memory required the simulator's mechs to be composed of common sets of components, arranged in different combinations to produce the different units of the video game engine to use. As such they very much differed in look and feel from the mechs the players of Battletech were familiar with thus far. But all was good in the Battletech land. Make no mistake, the creators and authors of Battletech have included some of the uh, very far-sighted and clever people. The background for the game has already explained why battles that could fit onto the table were the norm, with the prior successful wars having nuked the factions to heck and had set up loose ends that could be used to explain all sorts of things in later dates. Most of the huge army disappeared out of known space, for example. The first push to explain the differences came in 1989, with the 20-year update sourcebook. This pushed the timeline of Battletech Universe ahead, skipping over a fair chunk to get to the point in the timeline where these strange mechs would appear. Very clever. If the simulator setbacks had pushed the release dates out, there was enough future history in that 20 years to keep the game going with novels and source books. 20-year update could have easily been 15-year update, or whatever it needed to, be, to suit the release. That single slim volume set a stage. So it was that 1990 became the year of the clans. A series of novels were released to describe the return of this missing army, a scenario and sourcebook came out to describe one of the pivotal battles of the invasion, and Technical Readout 3050 introduced a series of modular battle mechs, Omnimechs, to the game, matching the designs used within the video game, all coinciding with the first Battletech Centre opening in Chicago in that same year. Players could sit in a simulated cockpit of a clam mad cat and virtually blow the living snot out of other visitors to the centre, while those of us not lucky enough to live anywhere near Chicago could do the same, albeit on a hex map with miniatures. The clan invasion, in-game, lasted for four years, 3049 to 3052, with a similar amount of time 
in real-world releases for the game from 1990 to culminate in the Battle of Tukiyad scenario in Sourcebook in 1994. But that is not to say that the timeline stood still. Remember, the novels had reached 3052 back in 1990 and continued to push the story of the Inner Sphere beyond that. So during that same period, we had the game materials released that described the post-invasion universe, notably with technical readout 3055, an updated version of the Mercenaries Handbook, Objective Raids and Hotspots. The Aerotech side game was updated in the form of the Battle Space game, and Technical Readout 3057 was released in support of that. Just a brief aside here. In 1995, a cartoon show was released for Battletech, showcasing the mixed faction unit, the Somerset Strikers, their battles against the Clan Jade Falcon, and a source book was released to the, uh, for the game to support that. Both are reasonable efforts, if not quite matching the game's canon. But check them out. As another brief aside, Battletech had been the subject of a number of computer games. The Crescent Hawk games in 1988 and 1990, and Mech Warrior in 1989. These were fun, and did reasonably well, if their real takeoff was with Mech Warrior 2 in 1995. This really set the stage for a whole sequence of Battletech computer games, still going today, with harebrained schemes Battletech, first released in 2018, and Piranha Games MechWarrior 5, released in 2019. Final aside, and this time I'm going to try and be brief because this part of Battletech history has been covered a lot. Remember we noted that the original mech designs that Battletech used were licensed from an importer of models from Japanese anime shows, well, Harmony Gold, a TV production company, had licensed many of those shows to produce its own variants of them for an American audience. These came in the form of the Robotech cartoons, starting in 1986. The show was formed by re-editing and overdubbing three unrelated shows, Super Dimension Fortress Macross, Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, and Genesis Climber Mos Aeda. In an attempt to create a single narrative across three seasons, the Macross Saga, the Masters, and the New Generation. The series has its fans, but if you bear in mind that the UK did not get Robotech until much later, and we were more familiar with the original shows and Battletech than Harmony Gold's mashup, from a British perspective, it didn't make any sense. This was compounded by Palladium Games, who had picked up the rights to produce gaming material based on the Robotech show, advertised in magazines that we did get, depicting mechs that we were more familiar with from the Battletech, uh, boldly stating, accept no imitations. Yet for us Brits, the mid-1980s was a confusing time for those of us that played games for an American publishers. Regardless, Harmony Gold and FASA came to legal blows over the designs that FASA was using in Battletech uh, that were part of the shows that it had licensed for Robotech. And, penultimately, the mess was settled out of court and Faza deposited around a couple of dozen mechs into the box of The Unseen in 1996. Basically those designs that were in illegal contention or could be in legal contention because of their imagery was not outrightly owned by Faza, stopped being depicted by Faza in Battletech material. This situation bubbled away for a while, but artwork for some of the designs were updated in 2003 as Project Phoenix, and more had been updated and retconned in 2015, ahead of the Battletech computer game. A further court case between Harmony Gold and the various parties involved in Battletech at the time ended up being settled, and we now have Marauders on our Battletech books once more. Yay! Well, OK, now that's done with, so on with the more interesting stuff. The timeline continued to be examined in novels and source books and computer games from 1996 to 2000, with further updates to many of the side games. Battle Force was updated in 1997, Mech Warrior the role-playing game was released in a third edition in 1999, and Battle Space once again became Aerotech in 2000. Along with a number of source books keeping abreast of the emerging history up to 3067, Leading into this time, Fasa was exploring the breakdown of the largest faction in the game and its descent into civil war. But before we got to that point, Fasa ceased trading in 2001.
If I remember correctly at the time, this was more a case of stopping before they were stopped. The period uh, from 1995 through to 2000 was not the best for the role-playing game industry. And I put Battletech into that category because FASA started as a role-playing game company and MechWarrior was, indeed, a role-playing game. And it is perhaps true that FASA didn't want to see themselves going the same way as GDW or TSR, who had both been large casualties of that period. I think, in retrospect, it was another of FASA's clever moves. By closing down under their own terms, they kept a degree of control over their intellectual properties, which has set them in good stead for their current position. Wiseman had started WizKids in 2000, and the Battletech IP went there. FASA Interactive, that had been set up to handle computer games based on FASA's property, and was the successor to Virtual World Entertainment, the company that ran the Battletech centres, had been sold to Microsoft in 1999. So all told, it was perhaps the least painful of all of the industry closures of that period. WizKids licensed Battletech to FanPro, a German company that had published German translations of FASA's products for some time. Fanbro hired many of the individuals who worked on Battletech at FASA to continue to carry the game under their ages, which they did all the way through to 2008. This saw completion of the Fedcom Civil War background and pushed into the Word of Blake Jihad period. Under the auspices of Fanpro, the collection of the myriad of Battletech's rules began with the publication of the Total Warfare Rulebook in 2006. This series, which was continued and completed by Catalyst, still forms the backbone of the game today. Several issues within FanPro, and disagreements with the Battletech authors and WizKids as licensors, led to the Battletech license coming to In Media Res in 2008. This company was founded by several of the Battletech and Shadowrun showrunners in 2003 in order to publish fiction for those properties. Having acquired the license to the game in 2008, they formed a subsidiary company, Catalyst Game Labs, and continue to publish Battletech material through to this day. As we currently stand at the time of this video, Catalyst has released new box sets for Battletech, a stripped-down Battletech manual, as it's in the throes of completing release of material for its Clan Invasion box set, and is continuing to maintain the backbone rule volumes. Battletech has never looked stronger. The play of the Battletech game, and we will deal with the MechWarrior role-playing game and its versions and variants in other videos, has not changed that much since its inception in 1984. Some elements have been tweaked here and there, usually with a mind to making the game easier to manage. For example, where once a reaction phase was included in the order of play, during which units would twist a mech's torso or, or adjust a tank's turret to change firing arcs, the current sequence omits this phase in favour of the faster and simpler indication of torso and turret direction during weapons fire. So, this is how the game goes. Each round, players roll two six-sided dice, the game only uses six-siders, for initiative. Initiative gives an advantage to the decision-making process of determining which units to move where and what to fire at what, whether that advantage manifests itself in the player activating units before or after the opponent. Once initiative is decided, players move units. Once all units have moved or been designated as not moving, attacks are resolved. Weapon attacks first and then physical attacks such as punching and kicking. Figuring out the effects of heat build-up comes next. Pretty much everything a mech does generates heat, and it's an important element of the game, right from the design of units to their selection for a scenario to actual play. It also adds an element of tension and risk to the game. Do you risk heat build-up disabling your mech for the sake of one last overpowering strike that may win the battle? Finally, the round is totted up, any burning forests are managed, and the game proceeds to the next turn, and so on until the scenario's objectives have been met by one side or the other. Damage to units is recorded on a record sheet by location, and which specific locations get hit by an incoming attack is affected by the relative position of attacker to defender. Yet another tactical decision element, 
Do you move a unit into a position that presents a less damaged area to the enemy than the left arm, which is now displaying its internal structure through gaps where its armour been, has been destroyed? Units have quite a few options at their call. Mechs can walk, run, and some can rise majestically into the sky using jump jets. Vehicles can hit roads for extra speed. Cover can be taken behind hills. Lakes can be entered to provide cover and also bleed off heat. And there are lots of other options. The game is generally played on maps overlaid with a hex grid. Although non-gridded miniature variants of the game have also been published. The current on those lines being Alpha Strike. A lot of these maps are available, providing a wide variety of battlefields from desolate moons to lush forests. So that's the basics. The devil, as they say, though, is in the detail. While the general principles of Battletech are really simple, points-based movement, simply generated target numbers and so on, the game adds complexity in the technological options that mechs, vehicles and other units can take on board. Things like missile beacons, acceleration circuitry, C-cube systems and so on all expand both the available tactical options as players as it is fingertips during gameplay. And the complexity of the game. Personally, it's a testament to the solid simplicity of the game's foundation that it can absorb such additional expansion easily when in its stride. Additional complexity can also be found both within the pages of the Battletech manual, the Time of Warfare and tactical operations books with further rules, options for unit types, capabilities, fortifications, weather, and so on. So, Mech Warrior and A Time of War, and classic Battletech role-playing, and Mech Warrior Destiny aside, how do the rest of the Battletech spin-offs figure? Well, the answer is simply scale. This is more easily exemplified by the core set of rule books. these being Total Warfare covering individual unit-scale battles, a unit being a mech, a vehicle, a fighter, an infantry platoon, and so on. The scale is on a one-to-one -one basis, and the size of the battlefield is around 500 metres to about a kilometre. Strategic operations, covering lance, company, and battalion-scale battles, this simplifies the statistics of units, enabling large forces to be deployed and pitted against one another. Battlefield size is around one and a half kilometres to three kilometres. This is the coverage of the Battle Force game. Interstellar Operations abstracts units down to formations and covers very large scale operations. Battlefield size is around nine kilometres to 20 kilometres for what is termed strategic battle force and entire planets for what is termed the abstract combat system, alternatively known as the planetary invasion from the Battle Force 2 game. Interstellar Operations also covers the Inner Sphere at War rule scale. At this scale, players deal with faction-level militaries, moving whole armies across the star map, as well as dealing with politics and economics. This is roughly equivalent to the old Succession Wars board game. Finally, Campaign Operations umbrellas everything by describing how entire campaign arcs can be put together using the various rule scales. The latter is, I think, the most intriguing book in the rule set. Imagine a grand play-by, pick-your-own-communication method of choice uh, game, where some players took the roles of faction chiefs and Inner Spheres rulers and the clan khans, if you will, uh, while others assumed the roles of regiment, battalion and company commanders. Each player would involve themselves with a particular scale level. The faction chiefs at Inner Sphere at War the regimental commanders at abstract combat system and strategic battle force level, battalion commanders at battle force scale and company commanders at standard battle tech scale. I think it would be an incredible game to play, but perhaps one that would require too much commitment on the part of its organisers and players. But we can imagine. The beauty of these scalable rules is that each level, while constituting effectively a complete game into itself, is also compatible upwards and downwards with its neighbouring scales. Conversion rules are straightforward, and each set of rules, regardless of scale or abstraction, is constructed using familiar mechanics and terminology. As I said, the core Battletech game system itself has changed little since its first publication, which means virtually every supplement that has been published for the game is absolutely compatible with every edition. 
this does not apply so much to the side games, meaning Aerotech, Aerotech 2 and Battlespace all cover the same ground but are not particularly compatible. So if you're using Aerotech, make sure you are picking up the revised edition of Technical Readout 3057 and not its original FASA release, which is very much a Battlespace supplement. The editions of Battle Force are very different games, and the Inner Sphere at War rules are not compatible with Succession Wars, although the components from Succession Wars may be useful for setting up and playing Inner Sphere at War. Now there's a thought. To summarise play, the basic game is relatively simple, and even simpler if you start with the introductory edition, but can be as com complex as you like with the number of options available. Whatever that floats your boat in the world of giant robots beating the snot out of each other, Battletech can provide. For sheer scope, Battletech is a kitchen sink, plus the rest of the kitchen, the house, and the houses of your neighbours game. Possibly even adding the park down the road, from its humble beginnings, as a hex and whatever you wanted to use to depict units on the map board game, it has grown to be the Rolls-Royce of mecha games. This is partly from the rules, but a good chunk of the credit goes to the ongoing saga of the Battletech universe shown through its fiction and source books. If you have watched any of my other videos, you may be puzzled by my telling of the Battletech background and meta plot here as an asset to the game, while I vilified use of such things in other games. This is because the way in which the background material is depicted in Battletech does not invalidate anything players do. Not only is there space aplenty amongst the stars, but each era of Metaplot, Star League, Succession Wars, Clan Invasion, Civil War, Jihad, Dark Age and Ilkhan, offers different play options, from technology base to the factions to areas of conflict, Essentially, the metaplot forms a framing device for your games, not a narrow corridor. And all being told, if you don't like the background, you can ignore it and just smash the snot out of each other's robots regardless. My major criticism of the game lies at the doors of the editors. Battletech gamebooks have been riddled with typos, misaligned tables, out-of-whack stats and things that just don't make sense. Fortunately... It appears that Catalyst have taken great strides to fix these issues, and most of the recent releases for the game have seen considerable improvement in this regard. Paperwork is also a fair criticism. In the core game, each unit must have its own record sheet, which means if you are playing a company against a company, each player has 12 individual sheets to juggle and track. If you're organised, not a problem. Otherwise, it can get messy and daunting. Of course, the trick is to start small, mech versus mech, and build up to larger scale battles when you've found your way around the record sheets. Clear identification markings on unit miniatures and corresponding record sheets also helps immensely. A very large tick in the positive column for Battletech is its community. The forums are active, as are its social media presence. Catalysts are better at engaging with their player base than, say, Wizards of the Coast, and if you delve into the Clan Invasion set's Kickstarter campaign, you will see just how above and beyond they are willing to go to support the game and its followers. All in all, I think it is true to say that Battletech is a game that is developed and supported by gamers for gamers, something that cannot be said for many of the top-selling tabletop and role-playing games for today. I should give it a star rating. I'm going slightly off rating games, as you may have picked up, that I'm reviewing games that I've played and, for a large part, kept within my own collection, so obviously not many are going to receive a low rating. But for Battletech, I'll split it up into its building blocks. The introductory set, I believe, is too simplistic. The core game isn't complex enough to warrant it, but it comes with nice miniatures which actually justify its cost somewhat. Regardless, this is a review of rules, not paraphernalia, so the introductory rules only get a 2 out of 5. The core set, the basic rules, and I include the Battletech manual here too, is a solid 5 out of 5. This is the base that I have played most often, and it's a fantastic pick-up-and-play to kill a couple of hours. 
slaughtering Davian scum on the field. Total Warfare also carries a 5 out of 5. A good mix of options and advanced rules, and more than enough for most players to keep busy with the game for many years. My first Battle Force game was fiddly but fun. That I will give a 4 from 5. The current Battle Force game I will give a similar score but for different reasons. I like the abstraction of individual unit stats but I'm not keen that individual units are retained. Perhaps because I got too used to Battle Force 1 dealing with lances rather than units. But Battle Force did give rise to Alpha Strike which in my opinion is the best miniatures variant of the Battletech game that has been dreamed up so far. Previous miniature editions were largely conversions of movement and weapon ranges to a hexless field of play, but Alpha Strike does things a little differently. It's fast and it's exciting. If Battletech is the full course meal, then Alpha Strike is the satisfying quick snack and receives a 5 out of 5. Now I'm torn on the Inner Sphere at Warfront. I love the idea, and I like the rules that it presents, but the record-keeping scares the heck out of me. I want to give it a 5 out of 5, but I have to go with a 3 out of 5, with Succession Wars receiving a 4 out of 5. Basically, Succession Wars manages the idea of conflict on an interstellar stage more eloquently. Also, man does the idea of overlaying sections of the Inner Sphere with hex maps absolutely suck. If the star systems were aligned in, say, a similar way to Traveller's Sectors, then it could work, but they instead use near real light year distancing. So, again, the Succession Wars use areas that makes more sense than the arbitrary hexes of Inner Spirit War. All in all, Battletech is a well supported, well written game. The Battletech game of Armoured Combat set is the absolute essential and contains everything that you need. Rules, map sheets, dice, some very nice miniatures, record sheets and reference cards. You can get many hours of fun out of this set alone. For your next port of call, I'd suggest Technical Readout Succession Wars. This will give you some more units to play around with that fit within the rules of the game of Armoured Combat set. After that, the next stop I'd suggest is the Total Warfare book. The Battletech Manual is another option, but almost everything in that book is picked out of Total Warfare. You wouldn't be missing out on anything drastic by skipping the manual. And that should set you for life. If you're intrigued by some of the advanced options that I've covered, such as Battle Force and Inner Sphere at War, then you are likely in the market for the remainder of the Total Warfare series of rule books. The Tech Manual, Tactical Operations, Strategic Operations, Interstellar Operations and Campaign Operations. The Game of Armoured Combat set also introduces you to the Alpha Strike arm of the game, and if that appeals, then pick up the Alpha Strike rule books. Everything else... The additional sets such as Clan Invasion, source books such as the House Handbooks and so on is entirely optional, but great to have if you fall in love with the background setting. And on the subject of the background, read the novels, especially those by Blaine Pardo, William H. Keith and Michael Stackpole. They are fantastic. There are quite a few giant robot snot-kicking games out there, some truer to the Japanese mecha genre of anime, uh, some covering specific franchises, and some that take on a more abstract board game approach. But to me, Battletech is the granddaddy of them all, and really sets the standard, which is probably why its computer game versions still have a strong sales, and it can launch one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns ever. So why not give it a try? If it has, you crying die, Davian scum, across the table, as your grand dragon places a lucky shot into your opponent's victor that cooks off its right torso ammunition bin and turns it into a giant torch, then it's all for the better, and the honour of the dragon.